evening, everyone. We're going to get started. Thank you all so much for being here at tonight's program on Cancer Urban Legends, Fact or Fiction. I want to welcome all of you who are here tonight, and I also want to welcome our online viewers who are watching tonight's live stream. Um, just two quick things before we get started. Um, please be sure to silence your cell phones. And um, before you head out tonight, don't forget to drop off your completed evaluation form. Um, so we'll get started. I'd like to introduce tonight's program moderator, Dr. Linda Malkus. We have a great program ahead, so thank you so much for being here. And uh, welcome, and I would like very much to introduce my wonderful colleagues, Dr. James Lacey. Dr. Vijay Trissell. Dr. Sophia Wong. The ever beautiful Dr. James Weissman. and the wonderful Dr. Uh, Joseph Alvarez. So we are um, here to, to do a, a, an interesting topic. When we first were asked to do this, I think we all went, what? But we're going to have a lot of fun with this. Uh, just because it is such a provocative topic, anytime you go on the internet or just actually listen to anybody, any conversation, these kind of questions come up. So my colleagues and I are going to really tackle a really tough topic here, uh, or topics. And so the first one actually deals with actually issues regarding radiation. And there are a lot of questions that come around uh, all kinds of things, low level, high level radiation. So a question that often comes up is, do cell phones uh, cause cancer? Brain tumors in particular, that's usually what I get. So my lovely colleagues, what do you think? Do cell phones cause cancer? I think it's pretty clear that cell phones don't cause brain tumors. There's a great study out of the United Kingdom that reiterates this. But I, I, I think one of the challenges of modern living is that we're exposed to so many things that we tend to trivialize the threats which are genuine and real, like cigarette smoking and not wearing seat belts, and fantasize these threats that are trivial into things which are truly frightening. So I think it's an example of where we become obsessed by the completely wrong thing. And there are several very large case control studies where, from a population uh, perspective, we study people who have developed brain cancers versus those who haven't. And those studies so far are pretty um, null. That means there's no link between brain cancer and cell phone use. However, that being said, um, cancer is a multi-year process, so it takes many, many years for it to develop. And I think there are current studies ongoing that will better be able to answer these questions further. So, so can ahead. I interject yeah, things? Uh, again, I believe exactly what you're saying, but the fact is that there are some studies that look at where cancers in the brain happen mm -hmm. and where cancers in the, in the parotid gland happen, which is very close to the air. And whatever the validity of those studies, I think what we have to clarify is there is an increased incidence of brain cancer on the side of where the phone is being used mostly on the side of the I think that's debatable. Plant. Some of the studies have not found that the brain cancers actually occur on the side that they're using the right. phone. So I, I just, I think what we as physicians and experts have to address is not just sweep it under the carpet, but kind of sure. confront those studies directly. And I think how I confront those studies is by looking at when those cancers happen. So you can have these confounding factors. And one of the confounding factors I want to tell everybody about is when we, for example, looked at coffee. Coffee was thought to cause, oh, this is causing heart disease. So there were these long studies for a long period of time that looked at coffee and said, clearly people who drank 10 cups of coffee had three times higher risk of developing heart attacks. But when you forgot that the group of people who drink coffee also smoke a lot, if you did not take that into account, if you took the smoking off the factor, then you said, okay, it's the coffee problem. But if you just looked at people who didn't smoke, 
who drank 20 cups of coffee versus two cups of coffee, they seem to not have a difference. And similarly, uh, again, I wanted to kind of agitate these two people and wanted to ask them, the fact is that a lot of the studies that looked at this brain cancers on the side of the cell phones and parotid cancers, it would have happened at a much later date. These cancers happened just like three, four years when cell phones became so uh, popular and so ubiquitous. I, I think what we have to look at, confront these studies, look at them directly, and say, no, there is no validity. These studies were done at a time when cell phone use was minimal and should not, should not have really that much weight. Okay, so I travel a lot, and I'm in the airport and in airplanes, probably, if not, just about every other week. And you all, you know, you're in LAX, right? And they send you through the thing where you're going like this. So here's my little joke, and this is what I do for all the TSA agents. I, I go through my thing, and I go, I get on the other side, and I go to the TSA agent, and I go, hey, do I have any tumors? And usually they go like that. And then they, and I say, uh, no, really, do I have any tumors? They go, we don't do that kind of thing here. You know, they have a, such a great sense of tumors. But how about that? How about the, the TSA exposure? You know? I think if you are traveling from here to New York, your exposure from just getting on the plane and getting radiation being on the plane is probably, I, I don't put a number to it, but it's many, many times, maybe even a thousand times more than what you're getting by that you agree little with that? x-ray. No, I do agree. I think the amount of radiation exposure that you get going through the screening process is trivial, and the amount that you get by flying is significantly higher. And again, you take that into account when you make your decision to fly. I, I just think that it's one of those things where we assign disproportionate risk. And, and by the way, I'm a little bit afraid of joking with the TSA because I'm afraid they'll oh. put me into custody somewhere. <laughs> You're right. You are so right. You They're know, watching. I, uh, but it just, it just uh, never mind. But uh, I, it just, I think it, what we have to look at radiation, uh, I, I think we, it's important to group them into ionizing radiation, non-ionizing yeah. radiation. So when you lump all of them together, you say, okay, there's clear evidence that, yes, radiation that we use for treatment can cause cancers, although at that time you have to balance what you're treating versus what secondary cancers you would get. Both the, uh, you, know, you know, the, not the pat down, but the, uh, the radiation at, at the airports. Yes, does the pat down cause cancer? That's a real <laughs> question, isn't it? Kevin? That's what I was going <laughs> to And that, just for the audience sake, when, when you're talking about ionizing versus non ionizing, ionizing radiation is the type of energy that actually damages the genetic makeup. So it actually breaks DNA, whereas the non ionizing, it's just energy. It's yeah, so, so energy. microwave heat, um, cell phones, radio waves, all of these are non-ionizing radiation. They should not have any impact. So it's okay to microwave your food? No. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, 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 go ahead. I, thought, I, I, I heard <laughs> head. I thought maybe. I <laughs> Sophie, go ahead. About microwaving your food. It just heats up your food. There's, it's a non-ionizing radiation. It's just energy. It's just heat. It just makes the molecules. I mean, the only thing about microwave is don't overheat your food because it makes the nutrients not as nutritious. Right. I just want to add to the cell phone discussion. It would be, as a breast cancer doctor, I can't leave it alone because there is a report from an Orange County surgeon about three patients he saw with breast cancer in, the, in, in their breast where, their, where they wore their, carried their cell phone in their bra. And he insisted that that was causing, and that's been looked at, and just like the dis distinction between ionizing and non-ionizing radiation has been looked at, it's not true, it's not real. But he swears he had three cases, he did some poll, and said that 75% of college women carry their cell phones in their brassiere. And I don't know, is, is that true? Because I haven't heard that. I I, I'm not I don't know. Uh, any, by show of hands, how many of you carry it in your... <laughs> the girls, okay. <laughs> but anyway, so um, here, um, how about, I've heard, you know, there's a, you know, I, like I say, I travel, and whenever I travel, and you say to the person sitting next to you in the plane that, you know, you are a cancer researcher, oh my God, I can't tell you, I know more about people on airplanes, you have no idea. So a question that sometimes comes up with me is, you know, if you have a house that's under high tension lines, uh, do, do you have a higher chance for getting cancer? Jim, what do you think? Yeah, that seems to be the number one sort of urban myth about cancer, the power lines cause leukemia. And 
So to build on some of the things that we're saying, it's a good example of why, even though we might say, you know, the evidence says this or the evidence says that, it's, it's easy to understand how these things evolve. So I have a, a brother who's one year older, and when he was 13, he was diagnosed with leukemia. And thankfully, he responded to the chemotherapy, and he's doing fine now. But as I got into cancer research then, and I started to see these stories, you can bet the first thing that I went back to was, aha, there's a power line in our backyard. And that's where we used to go play football and soccer and play at night and things like that. So it's kind of human nature to attach that narrative. It makes complete sense to try to put together those things. But that said, for power lines and leukemia, the data are pretty convincing. And it doesn't look like that causes cancer. If it does, it's going to be a tiny, tiny increased risk that's along the lines of what you were saying. It's kind of one of those things that we balance every day on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, and I think part of the issue is when someone's diagnosed with cancer or something that's devastating, I think the fact that we can't explain it or put our finger on the event that caused it is somewhat soul-wrenching. It's troubling. You worry about the next person to suffer. So I think we mythologize a lot of things out of a desire to make them make sense. But there are things that, within the limits of our knowledge, don't make sense. And we shouldn't believe that we can create these stories and they're true just because they seem to make sense out of something that's incomprehensible. I think, to, just to add yeah. to that, yeah, is that there is so much of a bias that we have when a certain event happens. And, and all of these studies, when you look at the recall bias, if you ask all the people, were you next to a power line? And people who have had cancers are clearly, they look at it from a different angle, like you said, rather than say, even if I was living next to a power line throughout my life and nothing happened, I would say, no, I never lived next to a power line. Correct. So even if those numbers are a little disparate, a lot of that is because of this recall bias that you have. You right. know, I, I would be interested in the audience's view because I actually think a lot of this traces back to Watergate, you know, the Nixon era, because I think <laughs> that was the beginning where we no longer trusted our institutions. And I actually think that people believed that they are either misled or lied to and, they, and that there's a great conspiracy out there from pharmaceutical companies and the government to not tell the truth and really it is the power line or it is the deodorant or it is the pesticide and we know because they're hiding it from us. And I think it's really important to understand it. Adam. How do you confront that? Sorry. I, I don't know how, how you would confront that. I think it's important that there be a, a transparency that makes people think, no, uh, let us talk about, for example, sweeteners. There is such a big industry yep. involvement in that, that people, everybody thinks that if sweeteners were to go away, mm -hmm. these are the three companies that would have an impact. And mm, a lot of the studies, if they're funded by these companies, you would not have validity. I think we have to be very transparent, independent in conducting all of these studies. I have a question. So this is, in a way, Well, I, I, here's where I think we have to be careful to, to, to not say no when, when there are populations that may be at significant risk. I agree with Dr. Trissal. An airplane flight from Los Angeles to New York is far more radiation than in a mammogram. If you look at population data, no. I don't think there is evidence that mammography increases risk overall at a population level, but there are populations that may be hypersensitive to radiation, people with genetic mutations that have radiation sensitization syndromes, may be at higher risk. So I think we have to be careful about radiating younger people who could be at risk, excessive CAT scans in young people, routine people wanting to know about tumors everywhere in their body and doing routine that is excess radiation and may be unnecessary. And I think, I think the overall answer is no, mammography doesn't increase breast cancer risk, but there are populations I think we have to be a little bit sensitive. And also you have to look at what are you getting out of that. So if right. you look at the mammograms, the amount, uh, the number of breast cancer that I detected earlier and what the benefit of that is, and with this minuscule risk 
which is, I agree with you, there is a certain risk with any radiation, but it's a minuscule risk. It's, it's much, much smaller risk than me going from here and going home in a car and getting into a bad car accident. I never think of that twice. I get in the car and I don't think... That's because you're in control of the wheel on the way no, home. That's okay, that's what that's about. I, I hope. <laughs> so, one of, so moving on, so some, we have some other myths that, that a lot of us will get asked. And one of them is, um, so how about blueberries and mushrooms, huh? Are those good for you? And how much would we have to eat in order to see an effect like we do in our mice and rats? Somebody want to take it, Sophie? Well, I think clearly nutritious values of blueberries and mushrooms are to be appreciated. And certainly they have antioxidant properties, which are good. But I think as a whole, we all need to enjoy a balanced, nutritious diet. And I think blueberries and mushrooms are certainly part of that diet. I don't think that there's going to be any one particular supplement or one particular um, mineral that's going, or one particular antioxidant for that matter, that's really going to solve all our you know, wonders of what causes cancer, what can prevent cancer. It's all part of a healthy diet, exercise, uh, healthy living. So Jim. Yes. How much would they have to take in in order to see some of these effects that we <laughs> see on the mice and the rats? Probably more than most of us could tolerate. Right, that's a lot yeah. of, you know, and I, and I have a nephew yes. who really loves blueberries, and I do not think, but I think it, he could carry it. It highlights one of the fun parts about research, and that we'll, we'll hear about an observation, a question. Does this cause cancer? Or does this prevent cancer? And the first priority is to get an answer, but then it'll also, as you hinted at, it'll open up some new opportunities to ask some other questions, right? For mammography, is there a subset of people that we should really study in detail to help them make informed decisions? Mm -hmm. For blueberries and mushrooms, even if it's not going to be the cure-all, is there something important we can learn about cancer overall? Is there something that those chemicals do to cells that we can turn into a new treatment a new understanding about cancer. That's where some of the fun downstream effects come. Especially like in a subpopulation, Correct. actually. Correct. That's, mm -hmm. that's a really, really yep. good point. I think the only um, berry study, if tomato is a berry, was that there was a definite decrease in prostate cancer in people who took twice the number of servings of tomatoes. And that was, that, that I think that study, when you look at back and forth, had some validity to it. But many a times we have to look- Is that cooked or uncooked? Cooked. Oh, so the cooked. Italian spaghetti might be good for you. Okay, yeah. so go ahead. <laughs> so I, I think the only other thing that I look at is, uh, you know, the proof of the principle. Right. If, if you look at how in the lab this one chemical, uh, this lycopene or this ingredient of, of the blueberry is an anti-angiogenic, you would think that potentially this little incremental benefit in getting your cancer cells under control. So one of the strongest anti-angiogenic factors are the berries, are the ginsengs, are wine, some of the Wine, Joe, tell us about wine. Well, I mean, I, I think these are all important scientific discoveries that have some importance. I guess when I talk to people and have these conversations, the question is, will berries help me a little bit? Or can you in your study identify a compound? It's tell me what I need to eat so I never will get cancer. It's, how can I do something that will indemnify me against any of this happening? And, and I think because people are looking for answers that may not be there, I, I've watched it throughout the years. It's been echinacea and ginkgo and St. John's wort and shark cartilage. And oh, all I want these, to touch on a shark oh, later. Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. There are all these things, and there's a mythology that grows up around them that if I eat this thing, if I take this magical pill, I won't get cancer. And I think part of what we need to do is engage people on a different level. I, I, I think that medicine is wondrous, but not magical. And we can't give people these magical compounds that will suddenly make the cancer disappear or never happen. And focusing in on global nutrition, mm -hmm. better dietary habits, healthier living, and getting rid of some of the things that are just plain bad for you is a much more fruitful, but God, it's a harder conversation to have. Totally, but I, I totally. think you, you have to look at these super high doses, you know, the number of blueberries, mm -hmm. they, they will interact with the medications you're taking. Sure. And we see that even with, mm -hmm. you know, antioxidants or radiation or chemotherapy, you don't know whether it will increase the toxicity, decrease the effectivity. And I think combining medications, like combining blood thinners yes. and, and uh, super high doses of any 
additional will have an impact. I, I, I do think we have, I keep coming back to this issue of trust from our you know, community of patients because we have sold them at times a bill of goods mm -hmm. that things were good for them and it turned not to be good. The mm -hmm. classic in breast cancer is the drug Prempro for postmenopausal women and we told it was the largest selling drug in the United States yes. for a long time and we said it's good for Alzheimer's, good for heart disease and you should take it and every woman was mm -hmm. taking it and you know what? Then we found out in, the, in about 2001 in a large study that it's significantly increased risk and now this incidence of breast cancer, certain kinds of breast cancer, decreased significantly as women stopped the drug. So I think we know that 70%, I think it's 70% of women or, or patients are taking some kind of alternative medicine yes. during their treatment and many of them don't tell their doctors. Right, right, they don't tell them. And, and, they, and it could countermand actually the therapy that's going on, right guys? Yeah. Yeah, so um, along those lines, um, another question that I hear a lot and people email me about is, because you're hearing so much about it in the news now is GMO food, <laughs> right? You're giggling, Joe. So giggles <laughs> over there. So tell us about this, Joe. What about, about GMO foods and cancer? You, you know, I just, uh, I, I was in Europe not that long ago and there is an obsession in the press about genetically modified foods and how they might do this to you and how we have to pass laws. In the meantime, I sit at a cafe next to somebody who's had eight glasses of wine and two packs of cigarettes. So I really think, <laughs> I, I really think the, the anxiety is directed at the wrong thing. Um, I don't know of any data that show that genetically modified food is bad for you. Now, from an agricultural point of view, if you have a certain population of seeds that may be susceptible to a disease and they get out all over the place, that creates an agricultural problem, but not a human health problem. And I think, again, people become obsessed about these things and demonize them without really understanding what's at play there. Thanks. So um, another along food is, um, what about soy products? There's like this other mythology that we have, or, or our question is, you know, I eat, I eat nothing but I never touch meat, but I eat only soy, you know. <laughs> what is, do they have, now, is that an increase for cancer? Because they're, they, it's like an, ast an estrogen type of, of molecule. Yeah. So what about it? Go ahead. Uh, that's quite a story. And this is an example of something that started from a very interesting observation. So on the whole, Asian women are less likely to get breast cancer than women in the U.S. And so we as epidemiologists start to say, why is that? What, what accounts for that difference? And one of the things that people have looked at is, well, Asian women eat a lot of soy, and American women don't, so therefore soy must be protected. Mm. And then we do the studies, and we try to accumulate the data over time, and try to say, well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Uh, and then, lo and behold, well, uh, others are looking into the lab and saying, what does it do in a Petri dish? What does it do in a rat model? They say, you know what? Soy interacts with those little estrogen receptors that appear to be especially important for breast cancer. So that must be the mechanism. And once you dive into that detail, we as scientists are pretty good with coming up with explanations. We can kind of <laughs> spin the wheel and say, well, it causes cancer. That's what Jim thinks is the problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think the underlying theme to what you were saying, which is completely valid, is it's the onus is on us to come up with a good alternative explanation. And sometimes we just don't have enough data right. to give a compelling answer. And then you all are left legitimately saying, well, if they don't know, how am I supposed to know? And part of it is just, unfortunately, being patient and waiting for more research to come in, waiting for more people to be in studies and to get definitive data. But I realize it's very frustrating at the time. Yeah. So there are things we don't know? <laughs> <laughs> Even among this panel, I would venture to guess there are things we don't know. But I know. think the current evidence is that soy does not increase risk for breast Correct. cancer. Correct. And in terms of consumption, the um, even the lowest amount of, in Asian women, the lowest quartile, or the, the lowest amount of consumption in Asian women overlaps with the highest amount of consumption in Western populations. So there's quite a dichotomy in terms of how much soy we actually eat here versus yeah. in Asian countries. Yeah. So I got a question for you guys, mostly for Jim over there. So can younger women get breast cancer? Absolutely younger women can get breast mm -hmm. cancer. The, the age distribution is that the overall average is about 50, and it, it is mostly a postmenopausal age group, but 
younger women can get it. And younger women don't have to get it just because of a strong family history. They can get it, and we don't know all the reasons, but uh, they could be environmental, could have to do with the nature of their, their menstrual cycling, they could have to do with their vulnerability, but absolutely they can. If you test women under the age of 30, for example, about 25% of them will have a hereditary predisposition, whereas women, you know, over 60, it's, it's significantly less than in, in the 5% range. So I think younger women get, can get cancer. They can get it more, a more serious kind of cancer. It can be harder to detect, but absolutely they can. Now you're talking about 30% of breast cancer patients? But 25% of breast cancer patients under 30 would have 25% of breast 25 cancer. 25% of the whole population. No, no, no. 25%, I'm sorry. 25% yeah. of breast cancer patients under the age of 30, which is very young, may carry a genetic mutation which increases right. their risk. So is that related to underwire bras? <laughs> no. And, no. And, and, and you know what happens to the underwire bra? The underwire bra, for those, why am I talking about underwire bra? <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, they have the most experience. Yes, why is it that gender you're talking about? But there is a syndrome called, and women who are either large or breasted or have worn a bra for a long time underwire, they get a thing called the brassiere sign, which is a, a in, at, the, at the lower part of the breast, what we call the inframammary crease, it gets just to be, there's a line there. It gets yeah, it's like be, your nose if you're wearing get, glasses, it, it, it right? It gets thickened. Yeah. So, <laughs> Breast cancer is not common there, but then it, you know, it occurs there, and it occurs right around that area. So I think that's where that quote legend comes from about underwire bras and breasts. But again, I think we have to confront the, the the population studies that people have quoted. So there was an anthropologist who looked at cancers in women who didn't wear underwear bras and came up with this theory that impedes lymphatic flow. Uh, and, and that, that is not a population-based study. That is an observation by right. anthropologists. Right. And, and I, I think there were so many confounding factors is that a lot of these women that were studied were the group of women, the white women who have a higher risk of developing breast cancer right. and the group of women that have a higher risk of having genetic mutation. So unless we confront that at the root, say this is the reason right. that this underwear bra actually the lymphatic flow is not in that direction. The lymphatic mm -hmm. flow is towards the lymph nodes, which would be around here. Right. So it would be inconceivable to think that an underwear bra would impede flow. It would actually, in any case, it would increase the flow. And so so I, this leads yeah. to a question. Go ahead. This is my theory about some of these urban legends. It's kind of like real estate. Location, location, location. Right. right? So it's not a coincidence that the theory is that the cell phone causes brain cancer because it's right there, right? And the underwater bra might cause breast cancer because that's where it is. And another one you might have heard is that uh, men, young men who ride bicycles are particularly likely to get testicular cancer because you're sitting on the bike saddle. And once you see those coincidences, it's, it's very tempting yeah. and easy for us to come up with biologic explanations. Well, you're sitting on the bike saddle, so there's a lot of heat and a lot of inflammation and sweating, and that's what causes it, the drainage. And when you go back then and try to sort those things out, we can say, no, it doesn't look that way. But the ones that seem to have legs, sort of no pun intended, right, the ones that <laughs> persist have that location link, right? Yeah. It just mm -hmm. makes sense that if you held a phone up to your head, you'd get brain cancer. But if that's the case, then why wouldn't you get skin cancer on the forehead? Or why wouldn't you get eye cancer and things like that? So part of that, we need to look with a little more skepticism on those ones that seem to persist despite the scientific evidence to the contrary. Well, I think one of the dangers is people will approach this uh, from the perspective of, I know the truth, don't confuse right. me with the facts, and, and, and don't bother to tell me about the facts that are inconvenient. And, and I think when you begin an inquiry that way, you're gonna end up in the wrong place pretty consistently. Mm -hmm. So here's one I have. Um, so what about surgery? All right, mm -hmm. there's a couple of them. Suppose I have to have a biopsy done. So will the biopsy spread cancer? Suppose I have open surgery, will it spread cancer? And this is a this is one this is a this is one of those legends out there. So well, there is some truth to it, uh, and the truth is again based on the principle. So if I have two exactly similar patients that have exactly similar tumors, and one of them I cut and take a little piece out, and I wait six months, this one will grow faster. 
And the, the, not just the proof of the principle, but even observation, when you look at it, you'll see that whenever we cut any place, the body tries to heal it. So there's a lot of growth factors that come in there. The cells multiply, the cells will grow. The question is, how do you do the biopsy? If you do a biopsy, cutting into a tumor, taking a chunk of it, that will actually stimulate those cells there to grow because they want to cover. They want to take that hole and cover it up. But if you do a biopsy with a, with a needle, and when you excise it, you excise the needle tract, there is not an increased risk of it spreading. And also, I think what you have to see is when you diagnose a cancer, and now both of these tumors, if left alone, obviously they'll grow, and they will grow and take over life. If we have to stop that, we need to know what it is, and once we do the biopsy, and then we do the surgery, it will not increase. I mean, that is the, uh, the studies that have been done is that if you leave these tumors alone, because not, not really studies that compare to each other, but when you look at patients who didn't take care of the cancer, it will grow. I just want to say one more thing. The, there are some cancers that are so aggressive that when you do the needle track, it has to be planned very well. Things like sarcomas. If you don't excise the needle track, it will grow back in that needle track. And that's where a group of people discussing how to even do the biopsy is important in okay. some diseases. Joe. Well, you know, I get asked this question, but I think, again, as VJ is saying, the big thing is that we're not just necessarily taking a biopsy and ignoring the patient for the next six weeks right. or eight months or whatever that period of time is, is that we need sufficient information to come up with a plan that makes sense. And then we need to come up with a plan and enact it and support somebody through the course of that plan. And the goal of that plan may be to cure the person. The goal of that plan may be to support them in other ways. But I think what we do happens in a context. And again, we take the risk, which may exist, but we also try to mitigate it by coming up with good ways to manage that person once we have that information. I hear you, VJ. I don't want to leave this audience thinking that a breast biopsy done with a needle is going to spread cancer because by and large cancer spread because of genetic alterations in their in the cancer and in their environment the mechanical pushing through a through a tumor is not what leads to metastasis so i think you're right i, I may have misquoted it's not the spread it is the local growth that that may be stimulated if you do an open biopsy and that's why the, the type of biopsy is very important a core biopsy does not disrupt the tumor. It takes a little core out of the tumor and should not be confused with doing an open biopsy. But I'll just counter that by saying ignoring a tumor is going to turn out much worse. Of course. So, so I think if the alternative is to ignore it or to come up with a plan based upon a biopsy, you got to do the biopsy. You've got to do the right thing. I think this again came back from the old wives' tales, and there is some truth to it. I, I think if we wives, ignore that. Old wives' tales. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I think the truth, you have to confront the truth, otherwise you end up, um, you know, becoming the same opaque, not transparent. Okay, so a question that comes up, and I, I get this, I'm getting it more and more, uh, I guess because it's, it's out in the news. So what is the link between diabetes and cancer? I mean, or sugar diets. I mean, we all is, oh, sugar is bad for you. And in that case, I should be one big freaking tumor at this point. But okay, <laughs> you know, I start my day with Twizzlers, okay? Yeah. And a few excedrins. <laughs> but okay, so what about that sugar and diabetes and cancer? What's this about? So you remember that first thing that we talked about confounding the smokers and the coffee drinkers and the heart attack risk? That is a lot of what's going on there and that these things travel together, right? So eating a lot of sugar can increase a person's chances of getting diabetes and can increase a person's chances of becoming obese. And we've seen now, particularly the last 10, 15 years, how much of a risk factor for cancer, for many different types of cancer, obesity is. And there are reasons biologically that happens. The fat cells act a particular way, they start to affect hormone levels, things like that. So for some cancers, breast cancer, uterine cancer, obesity is a serious risk factor and something that should be But the issue is obesity, not eating so, a spoonful of sugar, correct. feeding the cancer. And from a correct. practical standpoint, in our big studies, teasing out the different contribution of obesity, the result, with something like eating a, t a spoonful of sugar 
or being diabetes is sometimes very difficult. And some of the reasons you'll see questions in the news, even in the scientific literature, is that not all studies will agree on the best answer to that question. So the bottom line is? Bottom line is there are some what we'll call mechanisms. There are things that the body does when diabetes develops that could affect the probability that a cancer grows and keeps growing and becomes more severe. And so, so I would call it a real link. Mm -hmm. It's one we're still trying to understand exactly how and why it happens, but, but, this is but a, a real link. This is a huge positive because that's mm -hmm. something we can do something about. Right, right? Yeah. absolutely. Right. Besides absolutely. not smoking and not drinking mm -hmm. excessively, by right. exercising, by appropriate diet, by things that we recommend, we now have understanding right. mechanistically Absolutely. why that can reduce breast cancer or yeah. other cancer risk. Yeah. How about stress? I hear this one. Stress increases your can chances for cancer. <sighs> Go ahead, Joe. Well, I, there's a couple of thoughts here. I, I mean, the first is, that um, some of the behaviors that happen when you're stressed, like smoking and drinking, and some of the maladaptive things like overeating leading to obesity, can clearly be linked to cancers. But I, I, I think that it, we're looking for really simple explanations where the problem is people le can lead really unbalanced lives. And I think the conversations that we and have with people- And that's all of us up here, oh, I think. No, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, and, and aside from the fact that we're all a little bit unbalanced, I think on top of that, we can lead unbalanced lives. But I think we, we have this problem solution mindset in medicine where if you have this thing, I have this exact remedy that can fix it. And what hopefully what you're hearing here is healthier living, better diets, more balanced diets, exercise. Those are the things that in the long run translates into reductions in your cancer risk and maybe even better and more successful outcomes should you be diagnosed with a cancer. Right. So I think sometimes a myth begs a more important and better conversation. Like just getting some sleep. Yeah. I yeah. think so I think the healthy living part of decreasing stress, but I think even stress, you have to qualify. One is the stress that we feel because somebody cut me off in traffic and that is one kind of stress. I didn't get that grant. Huh? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> what are you doing? Okay. But the other stress is for example, a surgical stress. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the different chemicals that are released in the body that are defensive chemicals or chemicals that would promote tumor growth, surgical stress is known to decrease immunity. And if you have a stable balance between tumor and body and then a stress suddenly tips that over, it can clearly decrease your immunity. I think that part we know. And as you know, most of us make cancer cells every day in our body. We make hundreds of cancer cells. We all are cancer survivors, everybody in this room. <laughs> and our body seeks them out and fights that. If there is an imbalance in that, what I want to say is that this whole defense of the body against cancer is built brick by brick by brick by brick. And all of these factors together, and the only thing I can put together is, yes, no smoking, no, uh, 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 regulated drinking, uh, you know, decreased stress, no a, 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 a balanced diet. Physical I mean, those activity. are things that can be yeah. Yeah. stacked yeah. up and you can build yeah. a better defense. That's how I look at it. Now, do I have complete data to support each one of them? I don't. Um, but, but, but you also live your life with an incomplete data set. It's not like somebody gives you a book with yeah. every answer to every problem that you'll meet in life. And if you follow these I instructions, think I saw that it turns Costco, out well. Actually, that book. <laughs> <laughs> It's probably available on the internet. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, that said, I think you make the best decisions you can with an imperfect set of data. It's like medicine. What we know today will pale in comparison to what we know in 10 years, but it's built hopefully upon a rigorous background of looking at these things, investigating them, and trying to come to rational, evidence-driven decisions about what to do next. And although we don't know, I mean, I think from a population perspective, measuring stress is very difficult. So, you know, how do you measure it in a questionnaire? Do you take some biological specimens and try to measure immune markers? I mean, nobody really knows how to measure that accurately. So the studies looking at stress and cancer are pretty far and few between. That being said, we do know that getting a good night's sleep is good for your health. So that's, I think, what we have to keep in mind. Yeah, one man's stress is another man's joy. Correct. You know? that's <laughs> not, okay, we have, we well, have some surgeons who live on that stress. Okay, so here's <laughs> one out there. So does fungus cause cancer, I assume not mushrooms, and um, is sodium bicarb the answer? 
who wants to take that on? Well, I mean, it depends on if you define specific gen fungus on cancer, yes, but not that type of fungus that everybody's thinking about. So you have diseases like mucormycosis that affect your leg, and I have a bad athlete's foot that is untreated for 10 years and develops edema in the leg that can chronically cause cancer, but that is not the fungus we're talking about. There are some, some mushrooms that can cause liver cancers, uh, which are called aflatoxins, that can cause liver damage or liver cancers. Mm -hmm. But the regular fungus, I think if we're talking about the ones we eat in bread and the ones that are uh, mushrooms that are sold, I, I don't think there's any data to say they cause cancer. But uh, how about the right. sodium bicarb? That's, that's, that's the first time I've heard of it, by oh, the way. Yeah. Okay. I, I think if you overeat the mushrooms, then the bicarb might help your stomach a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but, but aside from that, I, I really think that these are people looking for magic bullets where none exist. Right. So the aflatoxin and the liver cancer yeah. link, that is oh, that's established. Right. Right. And right. I did my, my, my dissertation was in China, and it was looking at aflatoxin exposure, and we went to a small village in China. So where do you get aflatoxin from? Well, so they had corn and other grains, and the way they stored it was in, in the home and over the course of the winter. And it, as you can imagine, with this dried corn and you know, various grains just sitting there, it becomes, there's aflatoxin on there, and you can visibly see it. Yeah. And so I think that's a very real link. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so here's another one. Um, uh, do UV lights used at a nail salon uh, dr to dry nails cause cancer? <laughs> <laughs> We're all looking at you. <laughs> I'm hoping not, okay. So I don't think there have been proper studies that have looked at UV light and nail beds, um, nail can or cancer of the fingers. Um, how that being said, indoor tanning is a very real um, exposure that is associated with skin cancer. And the UV rays that can be used in some of the nail salons are similar. They're UVA rays. And although those are considered non-ionizing radiation, those are the so sunlight and indoor tanning booths. That's the type of UV radiation that actually is linked to cancer. So I think that there is some scientific plausibility that the UV rays would cause cancer, but I, I haven't seen the studies. I don't know that you know putting your fingers in there for what, 10, 15 minutes would do much, but I think there is there may be some leg to that. I just can't discount it at the moment. But if you do gel nails, it's only a minute. Okay. So <laughs> this is actually a good example. There, are, um, you know, the prevalence of uh, nail salon use has gone up a lot in the last 20, 30 years, and what you said is entirely correct. And I think we can take it a step further and That's say that- That's good, because she's your wife. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I trust her. <laughs> well, if there were a huge increased risk in cancer, then we should see it by now, mm -hmm. right? If it were such a strong risk factor, like smoking is for lung cancer, mm -hmm. then we would have seen it in our studies. So we can find some reassurance in the fact that we haven't seen an epidemic of cancer of the fingernails, even though use of those UV lights in nail salons has gone up a lot in the last 20, 30 years. But I think you can't discount it if there is a minimal increase. So Correct. we talk about hazard Correct. ratios. Yeah, yeah. If, if there's a minimal increase, yep. you would not be able to pick that Correct. out. You get more from flying. Correct. From flying? You get <laughs> flying, from Correct. walking around in the sun without sunscreen. I mean, we all Correct. get exposures. Right. I think, mm -hmm. yep. just a reminder, we have to be careful because just because something sounds reasonable doesn't make it true. And, and, I, and I think that's sometimes a connection in people's heads that we have to be very careful about. Otherwise, you would leave your life eating boiled potatoes in bubble wrap all the time. I think it's not a way to live. And we just, we have to grade the risk and be yeah. sensible about things without becoming so fearful of our environment that, you know, we turn into somebody sitting in isolation. I would be somewhere. much more worried about indoor tanning and yeah. going to the beach without sunscreen on. Yeah. Right. Totally, totally. So can people who don't uh, smoke get lung cancer? Yes. Yes, yes. but the, again, the percentage is much lower. If you take, and this is what argument the cigarette industry, the uh, tobacco industry Good. made. Good, and then march over to e-cigarettes when what, you're at it. Okay, what, go ahead. What, what they made, the argument they made yeah. for years was that here is 100 people who smoked, you know, 100 cigarettes over 10 days and they didn't get cancer, and here is two people who never smoke cigarettes get cancer. But when you look at the risk, and how I look at it is, is, is the seed and the soil theory. And the, 
the, the concept is that if you have a very fertile environment in your body, if your genes are just abnormal, and they're a little abnormal, and you get the inciting stimulus, which is the seed into this really rich soil, it will grow very, very fast. However, if you have the rich soil, but you have no seed coming in, nothing will grow. In essence, this is a combination of genes and environment. So if you have very, very weak genes that will give you smoking, that will give you lung cancer, you'll get that nevertheless. But majority of the people who have strong genes, when you get this inciting stimulus, the smoking will develop into a big tree because they now are throwing a hundreds of fertile seeds into this. Well, and I, I think also the other facet here is you don't want to trivialize secondhand smoke. Thank you. I wanted so, to bring so that up. So my uncle smoked five packs of cigarettes a day, 100 cigarettes a day. My oh. aunt died from lung cancer. So I, I think she never smoked a single cigarette, but effectively by being in that environment, she was constantly inundated with this. So I, I think, you know, there's, there can be something about this deceptive idea of that person never smoked, but they may have had profound exposures, which I think from a public health point of view, it's why it's important to limit secondhand smoking. But even smoking. people who right. have not had secondhand smoking can Absolutely. develop lung cancer, but yes. that's a very, yeah. very small percentage. Yes. How about e-cigarettes? Yeah. E I don't think there is enough really evidence. It's just come recently. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think you can even, even make a court about it. That's right what now. you were saying, yeah. right, Sophie? Yeah, yeah I don't yeah. think there, I mean, in terms of population-based studies, and you know, just looking at the outcome of lung cancer or any sort of cancer, it takes several years, you know, decades even. Right. Um, and so we it's don't have an indirect data. issue though, because one of the, the criticisms of the e-cigarette is that it encourages a behavioral ada adaptation ah, yeah, in yeah, yeah. people to see that they're still doing this because a lot of the, the addiction is not just from the nicotine, but it's the behavior that mm -hmm. generates in people. And if that becomes acceptable, Again, that because in Cal, if you go to New York, and then you come back to California, it's overwhelming. We don't smoke here, mm -hmm. and yeah. as a, yeah. but in other pop, and if you go to Europe, everybody's smoking. Everybody smoking smoke okay? in Europe, yeah. yeah. But the e-cigarette, I think, is a very potentially dangerous issue because it it supports a behavioral approach that is, I think, encouraging potentially something that really is dangerous. You know where all the tobacco industries are now, India and China. Yeah. Yes. Everybody is smoking. Yes. And you can't go anywhere without being a secondhand smoker. And okay. e-cigarettes are very dangerous in the sense that the, a lot of the safety studies have not yet been completed, but I think some of the ingredients in the e-cigarettes aren't quite as transparent as they are now in cigarettes. And they market them towards very young right. individuals, yeah. girls mm -hmm. and boys. They make them fruit flavored, mint flavored. Right. It's a nicotine um, a transmitter. And so a lot of the safety studies have been done based on they, the companies say that the ingredients are safe, but that's based on them ingesting it rather than inhaling it. And sometimes when you inhale something, it's very different than ingesting something. And, and so the question is not just now whether e e cigarette, maybe it is safe for the lungs, but what does a chronic nicotine do to the rest of the body right. and the impact right. it has is right. different. And what you're saying is very true because it's a, because it's a, a transmitter of nicotine, it encourages young boys and girls to become addicted to nicotine. And what's next? I mean, it's creating a generation of nicotine junkies. I mean, let's, let's be honest here. We distract ourselves by saying, eh, it can't be as bad in terms of causing cancer. But then all, all these people are sitting around vaping, you know, inhaling all this nicotine, getting hooked. And this, we have to be really careful the because drug. we're forgetting, we're having the wrong conversation. I think we're right. We'll figure out if it causes cancer. But then we have all these people that are addicted to this stuff. Totally, totally. How about talcum powder and uh, ingredients in cosmetics? And what are some of the other ones that come in here? Oh, and deodorants. Uh, how about all these? Do these cause cancer? No. 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 Boy, that was definitive. <laughs> I would say with one reservation, oh. I actually did a study of a population of patients with breast cancer who used you know, these anti-aging creams. Uh-oh. And some of uh -oh. these, uh, these anti-aging aging, aging creams had estrogenic-like properties to them. We studied this in a very high-level laboratory. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily estradiol, which is the provoker of breast cancer, but, but substances that, so these, the but rate. But not soy. 
Not soy, <laughs> but all this anti-wrinkle stuff. Stuff I now don't know that we me, know. Jim. So does it get absorbed, Jim? Do, do, it gets absorbed. studies that you check your blood and say that yes, there's a higher level of. Uh, yes. So the volume must be really high to get well, absorbed. Well, yeah, because women uh, use a lot of it. And do you think men don't use them? I don't know. <laughs> 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 Obviously not, Jim. <laughs> Joe, what are you saying? Well, no. I, I mean, I, again, some things we don't know, and I think you want to try to figure it out. I, I think one of the things that you're hearing is that we tend to dwell upon nuance. Yeah. For the majority, these things don't cause harm, but part of our job and responsibility as scientists is to figure out what are the exceptions. And right. I think if you become so obsessed by the exceptions that you figure out or lose sight of the big picture, which is, yeah, for the most part, these things are not troublesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how about having your clothes stored in dry cleaner bags? Is that cancer causing? Well, I, I mean, no. yeah, yeah, it, it's not, but it, Again, the, if you look back at the story, they used to use things like carbon tetrachloride right. and horrible compounds to clean clothes. So those things do cause cancer and leukemia. They're terrible, mm -hmm. but they've been banned. So I think you know some of some of these fears date back from things. Asbestos that, was the it, biggest. As, asbestos is bad. I mean, they used to put cesium on watch dials. They used to put yeah. plutonium in pacemakers. I mean, we've come a long ways. And this is sort of the counter argument to what you were saying about the government trust, and that we can never say with 100% confidence, well, they're, they're, they're not lying to us. But there is a long track record of things where the public health system worked as it was supposed to work, and the government did its job. So the dry cleaning industry has changed, and someone who works in dry cleaning is, is now exposed to much less of those chemicals than they were 50 years ago. Asbestos is not around, and so lung cancer is less of a concern there. There are regulations that limit all of our exposures to smoke. Yeah. So. Although we can, yeah, there's that whisper of a doubt out there that we can never fully resolve, as you said, but on the whole, things generally work the way they're supposed but to. But we saw with, with the tobacco industry for yes, how long. That's one big exception. How yes, long yep. they hid. They were ahead of us. They're and, much ahead. Right, I mean, correct. whether that is in propaganda, right. whether that is in buying right. time on primetime TV, right. preventing other people from exposing them. I mean, there was this great movie, I don't know whether you watched it, Thank, thank You for Smoking, or and it, it really is a parody yeah. on how they can tell you you're eating too much cheese or eating too yep. much fat and, and why don't you ban that and ban smoking. So I, I continue to think of myself as a glass half full guy yeah. and as epidemiologists now that story of what the tobacco industry did for smoking and the health risks associated with it is now kind of the playbook for how public health and particularly the policy side and the advocacy side are starting to tackle things like obesity, sugary drinks, snack foods, things like that. Because it works so well in hiding the risks associated with smoking, the public health community is starting to learn from that and respond much better to newer things like e-cigarettes and the obesity epidemic. Well, one of the challenges though is with the internet, people can access all kind of information right. which is pithy, uh, clear and absolutely wrong. Right. And I, I think there are a lot of people that have vested interest in counter-messaging things which are probably true and useful by trying to sell you a pill that's going to indemnify against So tell against me about cancer. shark cartilage then, <laughs> since we're doing mist, because that goes right okay. in here. So I've taken care of a uh, number of patients with multiple myeloma. This was more in the 1990s where they would say, I'm not really sure whether or not I should get this chemotherapy or whether or not I should actually even be seen in the hospital because I've seen these studies regarding shark cartilage and I know if I take this, I'm gonna be okay. So maybe I'll come back and see you in a few months. And I've had a, a number of folks who actually abdicated their care, walked away in the midst of it, did shark cartilage and came back in much worse for having done right. so. So it's, it's one of those tragic things where people had bought into this, this counter messaging and, and they've done themselves a profound disservice in yeah. doing so. How about peach pit? You know, Laetril was quite the, uh, I, I remember Laetril, I'm, I'm old enough to have remembered Laetril and all these other things and coffee enemas and all these things, which just sound really bad right now. But um, <laughs> the idea is that peach pits have a certain amount of cyanide and you would go to these special centers, typically in Mexico or somewhere that falls out of the uh, dominion of the FDA, where people could go and get these small infusions of what was basically cyanide. Um, and, I, and I think this is, this is one of the things that, that angers me the most, is this idea of false hope and people for profit lying to our patients 
getting them to do things which are not only wrong, but they're anti-rational. They fly in the sense of everything that we know. And laetrile and sharp cartilage are, are great examples of things where I've seen patients leave traditional Western medicine and, and be much worse off for having done Yeah, so. I think that's the central theme. It's not the, the, the substance itself as much as it's the absence of, of, of doing something that will actually do something good for you. Avoiding a treatment, not getting a, a surgery, yeah. whatever, because you're committed to this belief system that, that that's not really the answer. This is the answer. Totally. And besides, uh, just a, a note on the side, this whole shark cartilage thing has totally decimated the shark population. I mm -hmm. mean, it's, it's more than half of the sharks have been hunted while people are, and they're still selling them. I see them once in a while on, on ads coming up. So this is really a travesty. Yeah. It came up with this thought that sharks don't get cancer, which is a so false. So do sharks get cancer? They do get cancer. Yeah. As long as you have dividing cells, you'll get cancer. Right. Well, that's really do they still get cancer if they eat other sharks? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think sharks eat sharks. <laughs> Just a thought. Maybe not if they eat them in moderation. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Okay, along the same line, another question that has came up is, do cats cause cancer? Cats, those little felines, <laughs> little small oh, house goodness. pets, do they cause cancer? That's cause the first I've heard of it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> they cause allergies. Yeah. And some allergies, in, in some population-based studies, allergies actually stimulate an immune response that is associated with decreased risk of cancer. Ah, this is interesting. So. Can a cold help you fight cancer? Hmm. I'm going to answer that question indirectly. So there are hypotheses out there. I don't know if they're considered urban legends, but um, that you know, children who enter daycare very early, who have been exposed to multiple colds, who've gotten sick very early on, and have had this mixture of infectious you know, agents in their bodies, actually um, do better when they're older because they have built up this stronger immune system. And I'm not sure I should, uh, I should give this example here because it, it may You're you know, scaring me, people. <laughs> so, so there was actually, I do melanoma a lot, a lot of uh, melanoma studies that have looked at spontaneous regression of cancer. So somebody has stage four melanoma where they have melanoma in the brain, melanoma everywhere else, and they get something dramatic. You know, they get an um, IV poisoning or they get a bee sting or they get a bad cold and suddenly their whole immune system changes, it gets upregulated, and all the cancer is gone. This is a reality. So we used to see this, and this may happen one out of a thousand patients. It's rare, but it's real. Is that your immune system, allergies, and something happens in your body that suddenly tells this cell that is your defense cell and multiplies it a hundredfold, which we use in treatments like adoptive immunotherapy, and they go and attack the cancer and kill them. But the, I, again, as an example, it is real to give because then you can work on what worked for it, how we can change that in other people, but not very common. Well, and I think the danger here is I once went to Santa Anita and did pretty well on one of the races. <laughs> and um, well, actually you, you my went wife again, placed right? the bat and she did well. <laughs> did you go again? <laughs> I did go again, it didn't go anywhere near as well. So I think the problem is we try to take one of these very rare things that we can't explain and then generalize the findings in ways that, that, that you can't do. That's what I think, I think that's where it came from. I yeah. think this, this yeah. question of allergies and everything else, it, it, there must be, when I look at these, I look at what started it. You know, the underwear bra, these, these mm -hmm. studies that were, that are quote unquote fake studies, you want to know where it came from to see what the validity is. Well, and, and I think one of the things about the scientific method, I mean, one of the things when we do an experiment, we have a null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is this thing doesn't work. This thing that we're testing is not true. Mm -hmm. And if you look at people that are doing these kinds of studies, they don't have a null hypothesis. Their hypothesis is this is true. I'll ignore the facts that are inconvenient, and I'm going to prove that this is true. So I think we have to be very, very careful about how people approach these questions so that they don't bias the result by how they choose to understand. And, and who conducts yeah. the studies, what their motivation is. I mean, there's so many biases that we have, that, that we are born with, that we acquire. Absolutely. So, one, here's a big one. So does Big Pharma actually have the cure, and are they holding it out on us? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> 
I hope not. I, after spending about 11 years working in D.C. for the government, I did cancer research as part of the federal government before I came out here to the City of Hope. Uh, I can say, at least from my experience, I didn't see any of those conspiracy folks, and if they were there hiding away the cure, they must have been far away from all of the rest of us. So I know it persists, but I haven't seen any evidence to it. Yeah, I would imagine if, 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 if Big Pharma had the answer to every cancer, we would have access to it. It would just be ridiculously expensive. <laughs> Right. But, but I do think that the public is being protected by some of the new laws regulating pharmacies' access to us to influence our decision-making regarding medication because it's a profit motive right. to do that. So I, I think there is a public health and public interest served by saying it's not one, it's not big pharma per se or there is no conspiracy, but I think their goal is, yes, to make profit. These drugs are very expensive to develop. One billion dollars is the overall estimate to develop one anti-cancer drug. So, yeah, they're, they're, they're driven by uh, helping to influence our thinking. And I think that's changed in the last 10 years, and I think that's good. So now I can go and look at how many lunches you've had with uh, <laughs> drug companies in the And you last won't year. see any anymore. <laughs> but you went yeah. to Hawaii, right? <laughs> well, uh, so this ends uh, this portion of our evening, but um, we're now going to have uh, questions and answers, and uh, I have some questions from the audience uh, that they would like to have answered. Uh, so, Jim, I'm going to send yes. this one right to you. Do teachers have a higher incidence of cancer? And if so, do you know why? I love that question. Historically, teachers, female teachers, have had a higher risk of breast cancer than women who are not teachers. And why is that? It goes back to what you were first saying, confounding. Think of who went into teaching 50, 60 years ago. It was typically an unmarried woman, a little bit older. What we've learned since then is that Women who have children, particularly at a younger age, reduce their risk of breast cancer compared with women who don't have children. Hmm. So a lot of those early reports, which were legitimate and they were accurate and they were correct, said that yes, indeed, as a group, the rate of breast cancer among teachers is higher than in the rate in the general population. So what we've done there, and particularly in California, is we've turned that into a research opportunity. And one of the studies based here at City of Hope is the California Teachers Study. Starting in 1995, Dr. Leslie Bernstein and colleagues invited about 133,000 teachers to participate in the study. And the goal was to understand why have teachers always had a high risk of breast cancer. And we've answered some of it, and we've turned that into a whole range of opportunities. We're still conducting the study. We're still uh, collecting data, and these teachers have been great. And so we can take that opportunity, answer the main question, and turn it into a whole lot of other good stuff down the road. Great, thank you. Another question is, does birth control pills increase my chance for getting cancer? I mean, it reduces the risk of some cancers, like ovarian cancer risk, yeah. clearly is decreased by taking oral contraceptives. But I think one of the confounding issues there is the dose of estrogen in the pills. I mean, when oral contraceptive pills first came out, they were very high dose. I mean, almost an order of magnitude more of some of these hormones than they do now. So I think it depends when. Uh, and what dosage pill, but I think with a lot of the low-dose pills, we, we know that they can actually have some positive effects, particularly upon reduction in ovarian cancer risk. Do dairy products affect your, do they affect treatment of cancer or getting cancer, dairy products? Oh, boy. Oh, I love how everybody's looking so, at each other. Yeah, <laughs> so this gets into what we call nutritional epidemiology. We hinted at it earlier. How can we identify whether a particular food item we eat or a nutrient affects the risk of cancer? On the whole, dairy products are, they've been investigated a lot, but they don't increase risk of cancer by a substantial amount. If they do, it's gonna be a tiny amount in tiny susceptible so how, populations. So how about the but RBSP, the, the hormone milk and non-hormone milk? Thank you, that was my next question. Sorry. Thank you. Go ahead. No, no, and how about like when Good they question. inject animals with antibiotics? Actually, this, yep. is, this, is yep. this is out there, so I would like you guys to talk about that. Yeah, I would say looking at the literature right now, there's not enough information to say for sure that there's no risk, and there's not enough information to say there's a little bit of risk or there's a lot of risk. We don't know yet. 
think there are some ongoing studies that we hope will give us better answers in the near future. So would you personally drink the RBSG milk or the non-RBSG milk? <laughs> Well, I grew up in Wisconsin, so I have an affinity towards okay. dairy cows, and I, <laughs> as close to the farm, those real Cheese cows head. that I remember seeing as a Cheese kid, head. yeah, <laughs> that's true, yeah. <laughs> so um, here's one I, I'm, I'm kind of interested in, hair color, you know, I'm so taking my chances, okay, guys? <laughs> uh, how about hair color or hair straightening, these kind of things, do they promote cancer? <laughs> I think there's been several, I'm not a bladder cancer expert, but I will say that there was a distinction between sort of permanent hair color and temporary hair color. And there seemed to be a, a slight increased risk of bladder cancer in women who used permanent hair dye. And then of course there's the whole issue of dyes and, 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 and cancer, bladder cancer. So uh, I think the answer is maybe uh, but probably not as significant. Was it maybe but the, the aniline dyes, uh, Jim? Yep. Or, uh, no. Dyes have changed yeah. very a lot in the last right. 30 or 40 years. Yeah. So for non-Hodgkin lymphoma, for example, there have been several studies looking at hair dyes and the risk for non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And it's similar. It's the permanent dyes. It's the dark dyes. But it's restricted to the dyes that were used before 1975-ish. Mm -hmm. So the older dyes. I think the newer dyes that, you know, many people use today are quite different in formulation than those that have been linked to cancer. And, and one of the risks that's been in the media lately is the risk of formaldehyde exposure from Brazilian blowouts. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm personally not in much danger from this, but, <laughs> but I, I, I think you know, some of these, some of these uh, you know, have had kind of higher formaldehyde content and there's been a concern there. There are now some lower formaldehyde containing preparations, but, but that, that, that has been an issue of risk. Okay, no. how about uh, do breast implants increase your risk for cancer? So, well, oh, go ahead. Go well, ahead, Jim. The overall answer is no, but there's a very, very small, very uncommon cancer. It's not a real breast cancer, it's a, it's a sarcoma that is associated with, with these implants. And the number of cases is few, but um, I think the answer is Overall, no, but in a very small subset. So would it matter mm -hmm. if it was silicone or a saline implant? Well, say that again, DJ. Uh, what, whether there was a difference between saline or silicone implants. You know, silicone implants are rare no. nowadays, which is what I think the risk was. Um, I don't think that delineation has been made. So the Food and Drug Administration a yeah. couple years ago reported, or they made the report linking anaplastic large cell lymphomas yes. with breast um, implants. But the numbers are so small yeah, except that, you, lymphoma. but they yeah. can't delineate between saline or silicone. Right. But like you said, it's extremely rare. So I think the overall answer is no, but yeah. this link has right. been reported. And right. when this question came up, it was uh, a little over 20 years ago, I think in 1992, the FDA looked at the question and said, you know, we don't have enough information. So silicon breast implants were taken off the market. And in the time since, in that subsequent 20 years, there have been some good studies that have given us a pretty good answer, saying that it's unlikely that breast implants cause breast cancer. Uh, if they do, the increased risk is gonna be pretty small. Uh, yeah. Another question is then, would they interfere with mammograms? Thank you, and that I think was my we next have, question. We have a better uh, understanding of that. On the whole, the contribution of breast implants, be they silicone or saline, to breast cancer is gonna be pretty small, and it's gonna be within that realm of what you described, sort of the the daily life risks and benefits that uh, we encounter on a regular basis. But they do obscure, particularly if you form scar tissue around right. the implant, capsule formation around the implant, you can't mobilize the breast tissue to do an adequate right. mammogram. Mm -hmm. So there is a, there's a delay in diagnosis issue and there's an absence of, of optimal imaging and this is where things like breast MRI have to right. be used. And uh, if, if a person has had no one in their family ever have cancer, do they have any risk for cancer? They still have. The, the risk is that it is lower than somebody who has had a first degree, second degree relative. And it comes back to genetic. If I have inherited an abnormal gene from my father, then I only need certain amount of uh, damage to my other genes to create an abnormal gene that will create cancer syndrome. On the other hand, same way if I have an oncogene, which is an abnormal gene that I 
took from my parent that is creating a chemical, the other one is balancing it, there's, on, there's probably only one leg I'm standing on that would increase the risk. But even if you have not had inherited the gene from the parent, first of all, you can have a de novo mutation. That means from the egg to developing into a, a full human being, you can have a mutation. And the other thing is the environmental factors that you change. Uh, for example, uh, you know, gastric cancer in Japan, say, is 10 per a million, and in America is one per a million. And when those guys come here, the risk decreases. So there is certainly an environmental factor that would contribute to the cancer. Even if I have not had cancer in my family, I still have a risk. But I think the bottom line is that those with, you know, study after study, those with a family history of cancer <coughs> do have a modest increased risk of cancer right. themselves, but the majority of cancers that actually develop are sporadic, okay. meaning they occur in people who do not have a family history. Yeah. Okay, and here's a question. Should every one of us have our genome sequenced? <laughs> no. We'll go crazy with, with, the, <laughs> with the noise. <laughs> with the noise. Yeah, I'll tell you yeah. what I mean. Uh, yeah, thank you. Know, you. So, so this is the best example one of my teachers gave me. He said, you know, there are, you're reading a Reader's Digest book. And there are the articles. Is that the large font or small font? Large font. <laughs> okay. I can't read okay. small font anymore. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if you, if I have a mistake in the article that I'm reading, that's a real jar. But if I have a mistake in the advertisement, I don't even look at that, and it doesn't matter if there's a mistake in there. So there are big areas of gene that don't contribute to my functioning. If there's a mistake in that, and the genome sequencing tells me there's a mistake in that, I go crazy and say, I have a mistake in the gene. What do I do now? I mean, a lot of the, of the problems in the genome, we don't know what to do with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, even in breast cancer, there is the breast cancer gene where we know there's an abnormality, but that is not the one that is causing cancer. So here's a question. So um, you have your s DNA sequenced and you bring it to your doctor. What's going to happen with that poor person? <laughs> I, I, and, and less by serendipity, you've discovered that this person has a known cancer-associated gene. In general, the doctor will put it in the chart, smile politely, and then forget that you gave it to them. You know, it's one of the most exciting areas of research right now, because this wasn't even possible. You couldn't have asked us this question five years ago, no. ten years ago, and it's research that's being done here at City of Hope, elsewhere throughout California, elsewhere throughout the country. I think we'll have more answers. This is one of those stay tuned items, but right now I agree with what you said. Don't know quite what to do with it, but we should know more in a few years. Yeah. Well, with that, that ends our evening. And uh, we thank you very much for all your participation. And I thank my colleagues who are pretty terrific. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.